Hi, my name is Sandarya and I'm the creator of Unchak Book Club. Welcome to an edition in the Extraordinary Visa Library, where we bring in past recipients of O1, EB1, and EB2 NIW visas to understand their journey and demystify the process to help more talented immigrants like you get these visas. In this edition, we have Pavitra Ramurthy. Pavitra moved to the US from India to pursue her master's in human computer interaction at the Indiana University. She got an internship offer from Salesforce as a product designer, which she then converted into a full time position. After steady growth and working on very impactful projects at Salesforce, Pavitra decided to apply for her EB1A in February 2023. Within four months of putting together her application, she got her EB1A approved without an RFE. She currently works as a lead product designer at Salesforce. Pavitra Ramurthy, ladies and gentlemen. Let's dive in. So, Pavitra, I would love to know. What was your motivation to even look into the EB1A, first of all? Because it's not something that people hear about as much. Uh, yeah, great question to begin with. Um, so back in 2017, um, I, have, I, I had a big, deep interest in robotics. And I did a lot of work um, project-wise and also, you know, exploratively, exploratively all by myself. Um, outside of the coast work, I worked on several robotics projects and I had the first opportunity to file for a patent at that time. After I started at Salesforce, um, a, a year later, I found myself filing for more patents. Um, but I think the idea behind me even beginning to file that patent is uh, when I had my first patent for the robotics, I had just heard somewhere that, oh, patents can lead to a faster green card. And uh, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that was. That's all I actually knew. So um, when I uh, filed for my first few patents and, uh, you know, um, the the USPTO was taking a look at it. So there was this uh, significant wait time. But I wanted to get a little ahead and I wanted to learn a little bit more about what that means, what that green card for patent means. So I touched base with my company lawyers and I just threw out this question because they at that time they were filing for my H-1B. So I just threw this question at them. It's like, I have all of these uh, you know patents that I'm filing right now. Uh, what does this mean? I've heard that you can get a green card or at least fast track your green card through this. And uh, that's when I got introduced to EB1A. And that's that was pretty much how uh, I began working towards this whole thing. I don't think anyone else has such a story of how they discovered the EB1, actually, um, in terms of you weren't even looking for, it sounds like, getting a green card or PR when you started the process. You just wanted to look in, um, you know, talk about, think about patterns, and then you got here. Um, you know, you're also a very, you have a very unique history because you didn't come to the US directly for a master's. You came on an F2 dependent visa at first. So um, I assume you came with your partner when they came for their master's in that case. So what made you want to first go through a master's program when you came here? Uh, interestingly, you know, I, I had a very good career uh, in India, uh, but my husband and I both, both realized that we weren't getting anywhere. We weren't really growing in our careers. We mm -hmm. had kind of hit like a point of, uh, you know, uh, a point where we were pretty satisfied with the kind of stuff that we had done, but we wanted to grow more and explore more. So both of us kind of aligned on that. And at the same time, we started looking at other career trajectories. So that's when we discovered, you know, product design. In my case, I actually discovered my love for robotics and that pulled me into product design. So that's kind of how it went. We both applied uh, at universities. I actually had a... Uh, you know, this is very interesting. It might be very useful for a lot of people to hear. I had a three-year three year bachelor degree. Um, most people have four-year bachelor degree. And over here in the U.S., you're not considered a uh, to have completed the full credit if you don't have a four-year degree and you don't have uh, the same amount of credits that they are looking for. Um, so even though a three-year bachelor degree is very much legitimate, a lot of universities refuse to even look at my profile. And I did not know that because they don't openly say it. So when I first applied, I just got rejection. So in 2020 is when it sounds like you discovered this option called the EB1. Um, and what was the very first step you took? And I asked this because a lot of people, when they see, 
when they hear about these visas, they go and read the requirements and then they feel scared, thinking that there is no way I'm going to match this criteria or no way I can I can match up to the bar that this has. So and then they stop even before they begin. So I'm curious if you felt that as well. Um, and if yes or if no, what did you do after feeling that? Well, um, yeah, I did. Actually, I felt that. Initially, I did not feel that because I thought uh, my um, my case had something. I had patents. I had uh, I'd worked in robotics. I had gotten media attention for the work that I had done in robotics. I we um, so my partner, uh, you know, of the project, we had filed patents for our robot, but we also uh, participated in innovation challenges, and we won funding. We actually won all the innovation challenges that we went to. Uh, Sorry, one was the innovation challenge. There was this fall uh, project that, uh, you know, showcase that we had won. We had submitted paper to the Human Robot Interaction Conference and it was accepted and we actually presented there. So, uh, and we got a lot of media attention through that. Um, so when I spoke to the lawyers first, from my end, I felt like this case had something that, you know, I was definitely able to see that I could apply to more than three criteria. But the lawyers did not feel that way. The company lawyers, uh, they were not very encouraging. They said that I probably had a borderline case. It's likely that it would go into an RFE, that there would be a lot of paperwork. They said, I need to improve my profile. You know, let's talk about this after a couple of years. You should go through, you know, uh, improving your profile and then we'll get back to it. So at that time, I did right. feel, I felt very discouraged. Um, but I went back and I uh, spoke to, I, I thought, okay, I need, I need another consultation. I need to talk to someone else. So I got another uh, consultation with Murthy Law at that time. Hmm. And uh, they uh, reflected the same thing. You know, they told me pretty much the same thing that my hmm. uh, company lawyers did. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, if everyone's saying this, then maybe my profile is not strong enough. So uh, at that time, what I did was I had already created kind of like a strategy sheet to talk to my company lawyers at that time, kind of like a checklist uh, to show them that here are all the criteria that, you know, that matches. I used that as a uh, reference point to start working on my profile to show even more proof where things aren't in the hypothetical that I could show that I was doing some industry work. Uh, currently as a professional at Salesforce to further, you know, uh, strengthen my uh, application. And I went from there. Wow. It's amazing that you didn't stop after the first consult when they told you that you're not ready. Um, you know, you got a second consult and in the end, then even then you kept going. Um, it's a great lesson for anyone listening to this, that do not stop at first consults just because someone's telling you you're not ready. Um, and even then, people are telling you're not ready now. They're not saying you will never be ready. So I think that's important yeah. to understand. Um, yeah. You know, it's pretty clear your niche is product design. But when you started putting together the application, I'm curious, what was the exact sentence you used for, this is where I'm an expert? Hmm. Um, well, it was a pretty long sentence. Um, so... Uh, well, I um, I don't remember the exact sentence, so I'm just going to tell you what it was like, right? Yes. So an expert in product design, motion UI uh, for technology and robotics. So, yeah. Product design, motion UI for technology and robotics. Wow. Okay. I, I don't fully understand <laughs> that, but that's that's a good thing, I think, in this case. So Yeah. Uh, um, my lawyers wanted to be very specific about my area of expertise. Um, I come from a very, uh, you know, deep background in animation, having worked as a mm -hmm. character animator for TV shows and movies in a previous career. I came into uh, product design after that. I actually use a lot of my uh, animation skills for the job that I'm doing right now because I uh, ran a complete initiative to systemizing motion UI for Salesforce from ground up. Um, so, you know, there are touch points that scales from my previous career to here, but with this product design, uh, you know, as an area of expertise, the field that I work in. Um, I also um, very, uh, you know, 
I, I'm very technical as well. I code a lot. And, uh, you know, a lot of the work that I put out is very tangible. It can be, um, let's see. So, you know, you can, you can draw a line and say that this person has skill set across uh, mm. multiple areas, such as mm. front-end development, motion UI, and uh, product design. They can wear multiple hats. They can be a product manager. They can be a design technologist. So, and they have robotics background, which means that I have specialization in IoT. And uh, um, and now in AI uh, is a big area that I'm exploring, but I have done work in robotics. So that helps me explore this a little bit more deeply than a your traditional product designer. So mm -hmm. I think that really matters. Um, and hence, packaging it as an expert in motion UI product design for field of technology and robotics is very apt, I think. It kind of covers all of these different things that I do. I think so. I Yeah, I haven't, I think you're the first person I'm talking to who has such diverse skill sets and pretty complex topics all in one. Um, so, but, you know, it also sounds like this sounds very artist centric as well. So there's the O1B, which is meant for artists and designers. I'm curious if anyone mentioned that to you and if you even thought, okay, maybe I could try for the O1B at some point. Actually, no. <laughs> you know, yeah. funny enough, this is the first time I'm hearing of it. O1B. Oh, really? I have never heard of it before. Yes. <laughs> Got it. It's, it's not a it's not a green card, it's a temporary work visa. So that's why maybe people have, might not have mentioned, but I um I know that a lot of designers use the O1B as a route to get their extraordinary visa temporarily before filing for an EB1. So, you know, you kind of right. went for the direct yes. green card anyway. Yeah, um, I, I went directly for the EB1 uh, because I was already on H1B and hmm. uh, it was uh, pretty safe, you know, at the time with hmm. the Salesforce hmm. filing for my H1B. I didn't find a need to look at another visa category. Uh, for sense. me, my goal was to fast track my green card because otherwise the green card wait time was like, 20, 25 years, I would have had to wait for my toddler to grow up, turn 18 and then get me, you know, uh, yeah. my green card. In fact, my husband and I were on the same page about the fact that if we cannot fast track the green card, we were ready to leave the country and go somewhere else where we huh. could get a lot more stability. So it was like, let's see if this happens, you know, and let's give it a shot. Hence, it was always about the green card rather than any other visa. Wonderful. Um. So, Let's dive into your EV1 application. You you need to meet three out of eight categories. In your case, it sounds like your top three strongest categories were original contribution, critical capacity, and press. So I'd love to dissect each of them and talk about exactly how did you put together the packet, the application packet for this. So let's start with original contribution. This is one of the harder categories, to be honest, because here you have to show that you've significantly impacted your field. So I know you had some patents, but how did you approach the evidence? Yeah, uh, this is a great question. My original contribution spanned across multiple areas of the field, starting with robotics to my current work at Salesforce. I briefly mentioned that I ran initiatives for Salesforce from scratch, from ground up. There aren't many product designers who are very well versed in motion. Um, so motion is a very niche skill, skill set. Coming from an animation background, I have deeper understanding of motion than your regular motion experts as well, because I come from a school of thought of traditional character animation learning. Uh, you know, how it was done back in the 20s and 30s with cell animation and, you know, um, and with that learning, I was able to translate deeper understanding of what it requires for motion UI to be part of an interaction design. Hence, uh, I, I don't think there was anyone else who, could have run that initiative from ground up. It took three years for me to do it. And there were a lot of stuff that came out of that initiative. A lot of end user, uh, you know, products that had touch points. Um, in fact, because I ran it from a design system standpoint, our touch points were across 13 different product clubs. So there was considerable impact uh, that I could actually show because of that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, apart from that, I was, you know, I, I was able to identify that there could be a lot of patterns that come out of it, 
by the time I filed for the EB1A, I had uh, 12 patents that were issued from, you know, uh, USPTO. Yeah. So that, that definitely was, yeah, that oh was encouraging. But also I wouldn't say that that is a requirement. I wouldn't want anyone to listen to this and think mm, I need to have point. 12 patents. That is not important. What is important is that your contributions can be shown very specifically and very deeply with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, very extensively, right? Uh, so you need to provide a lot of details as to why your contributions created that much impact for different products. In my case, I was able to show it through the patents and through the fact that there aren't other product designers who are well-versed in this, like I am, who can both code and create motion interactions. There aren't a lot of designers who can do that. Um, so, you know, I found my niche and I was able to go deeper into that. And all of the recommendation letters that I, uh, you know, got spoke about this to a great deep extent. I had engineering managers talk about how I was very capable of uh, talking in the engineering terms in order to make sure that something can go from concept stage to complete production stage and could come out to the customer experience intact, right? Uh, in a lot, in a lot of cases, uh, design gets gets dissected. It gets pulled. Uh, you know, it, it gets changed at the production stage. You know, your final output may not really look like what you're creating, in, uh, you know, beforehand. But because my skills could scale, I was able to be part of the entire process. So I was able to show that you know that level of depth, uh, if you can actually show in whatever field that people are in whatever thing that you specialize in and you can do, that was a, that's what is important. Um, mm -hmm. So you can show original contribution in different ways. It need not really be patent. But for me, it was through the patents and through, you know, right. proof around all of this. Wonderful. That's actually an excellent point. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so in your case, for the original contribution category, was it just you showing 12 patents and submitting that as evidence? Was that it or was there more that you put together in there? We showed uh, metrics around the kind of work that the patents related to. And, you know, uh, these were key metrics to show the impact that it had. Um, so it's not just enough that you have patents for something. You need to show that that is being used in the field, that it is creating a considerable amount of impact. So any kind of metrics around that would be super helpful. Um, we further push that point through the recommendation letters uh, from people from the top of the field who were aware of my contributions. So could I maybe double click on the metrics part? What did you show as metrics in your case? Yeah, so end products um, that were cu currently in use that were customer facing. So showing things such as uh, if it is, in my case, like there were a lot of guidelines and uh, uh, um tangible ways that someone could potentially use a, the system that I had led and, you know, uh, initiated for Salesforce, how customers might access and use that. Now, when they uh, get on the website for the this particular uh, piece of product, they are utilizing it by consuming it. So showing metrics around how many users were actually accessing this on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Uh, from a certain, you know, like within a certain qu quarter maybe or between a certain period of time that the evaluation happened. So that could be metrics. So ROI, right? Like ROI around anything um, that you uh, led or you influenced. You can show metrics around that. Uh, I had actually published education modules for uh, end users, customers, even internal mm. users. Um, showing metrics around how many people use the education modules, right? Gotcha. So that that creates, that shows impact. Um, Amazing. So yeah, yeah. But it's not always the case where you have to show metrics around things exactly like this. You know, you might, you might be influencing products that influences other products, right? Mm. So I would say you need to think about this a little bit creatively, right? Mm. Uh, when... When people say, you know, show, show me metrics, show me ROI, it doesn't necessarily mean a direct connection to exactly your product out there, people are seeing it. You may have impacted on like other products that are creating considerable noise out there. So you need to identify those and bring that to surface. Once again, another great point, um, because I think certain people don't get the privilege of working on products that are front end. 
So it's hard for them to show that. So um, in your case, though, you know, it sounds like things kind of came together very well for you in the original contribution front um, because Salesforce, millions of users, so you could show large numbers there. Um, yeah. So that was about original contribution. So you talked about patterns, metrics, and recommendation letters. Now let's move on to critical capacity. Critical capacity is another, I would say a harder category to get evidence for because you have to play a critical role in a big company. Um, in your case, big company, you were Salesforce. So, you know, one of the biggest players out there. But uh, in terms of showing that you were critical in such a big company, how did you do that? Yeah, um, this is a great question. And I think this is a very individualized, uh, you know, perceptive, uh, perspective. And I think that's why this is very, very hard as a category. Uh, you know, what seems critical to one person may not seem critical to another person. In my case, like I said before, my skill set are so niche and unique that not a lot of people can perform that. That itself made me a very big asset to the role that I was playing with Salesforce. Mm -hmm. I was running an initiative that required a person with that kind of a niche skill set. And hence, we were able to show how I was a one-off and that, you know, I was very vital in order to lead this initiative. Mm -hmm. And especially to the, you know, length and the depth that I did. Um, because it was a long-term initiative, there was a considerable impact across several different products. We were able to show that there were quite a bit of demand for it, even internally and externally. And because I was there to lead it, all of that happened. And again, mm -hmm. endorsement letters really added substantial sub Sorry, I cannot speak today. <laughs> uh, a lot of value, yeah, substantial value. That's what I was going for. Yeah, substantial value to uh, everything that we were saying on like why this person is providing critical level of you know mm. uh, impact to the work that they are you know doing. Um, I also showed that because uh, in a way where you know it is traceable. So I have appeared in conferences to talk about my area of expertise, my field, my skill set, but also you know, demoing products that actually use the work that I have done. Uh, that showed that I was taking a leadership role in a lot of this. And that was very, very vital, you know. Uh, they want to see that you are impacting the product at a strategic level, as well as a very specific technical level. So I was able to mm. scale myself that way. And um, because of that, I was able to, you know, also... Um, get a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like everything that we had in the endorsement letters push the point that I was this person who could work at that level, both those levels, right? Mm -hmm. At a micro and a macro level and why I was the only person who could have done that. So what I'm hearing is letters, obviously, because I think that's the... Um easiest way to attest to someone's critical role yeah. is someone, you know, who is within the organization, an expert talking about that. Besides letters, what else did you show, if anything, for this um, criteria? Uh, so critical contribution to, well, there were two parts to this. One is critical contribution to the company, then the critical contribution to the field. Um, hmm. You know, at that time, uh, I was able to show multiple things. So the work that I had done for robotics, um, uh, appearing in conferences, um, hmm. uh, the robotics conference where I presented my paper and my robot. Um, showed, so there were links to that. So we submitted those. Uh, the paper itself, we submitted. The work that I had done for Salesforce, everything that is customer facing were submitted as links, as proof. Got it. Um, okay, so one, one great way to tie all of this together. Uh, when I first launched the product, I wrote blog posts about it. And a lot of the blog, the, actually I wrote two main blog posts, right? So these two main blog posts that I had written was really external facing for, you know, I did it to educate our customers on what is new, what is coming, why they should know this, how they should learn this. And, you know, here are the education modules that you can go and further access in order to learn more about what we are putting up there. So there are like four parts to it. There are two blog posts, then there are the education modules. This got considerable attention from, uh, you know, uh, the design community. Smashing Magazine covered about it. 
um, a podcast actually spoke about it. And I was directly credited because these were my blog posts and I was the author and I wrote about this. And uh, because I led it, um, when others wrote about it, they called me by my name and they actually spoke about the impact mm. that this could potentially have for customers. So there was traceability here that just beautifully connected all of those dots that might be you know, missing if it wasn't there. Um, right. So yeah, I guess my advice to like anyone looking at this kind of, uh, you know, critical capacity, original contributions, make sure you're out there, put yourself out there, make sure your name becomes a known entity that they can, people can connect your name to the work that you're saying that you have done. Um, you know, that's a really great way to strengthen your profile, I think. Absolutely. I mean, we wouldn't be talking right now if you hadn't say discovered me on LinkedIn through something that I posted out there. And so yeah. I've realized that personally as well, I have benefited a lot from sharing what I'm doing publicly. And uh, in your case, it sounds like this actually helps us lead into the next category, which is press. So, or uh, they call it publications. So publications is where you have major trade publications, media and other platforms talking about you and your work. And it sounds like in your case, that happened very organically. You weren't searching for any of this to happen. So um, did you ever get inorganic press in terms of paying a PR agency and getting press or was it just organic? No, um, I never paid anyone for any kind of press attention. It hmm. was, as you said, it was very organic. Um, the thing is, and that would be my advice too, you know, uh, USCIS, I mean, paying, paid uh, press is not something that will actually strengthen your case. So my advice is don't do it. Don't waste your money, right? So, uh, you know, I know that people pay to get their profiles done and everything. Um, you would have done everything that you say you you would have, right? But when you pay for someone to cover about you, that is immediately something that reduces the legitimacy of what you're saying to an extent, at least based on what I've seen in my experience, right? Uh, when something comes unpaid and it's organic, it is out there. And, uh, you know, it it is very genuine. There is less scrutiny around something like that because it is obvious that, you know, there is a connection that, that there is a reason that an organization is covering things um, around the work that someone has done. The way to get, you know, actually do this organically, like you said, you know, how did it happen in my case, right? It's work that I'm putting out there in public. Um, that is important, you know, speak about it, write blog posts and talk about the work that you have done, talk about the product, talk about the impact, you never know. There might be other publications that take notice, right? If you're working for a big company, there are marketing teams out there that would actually be promoting your blog posts. If they promote your blog posts, then tech, tech magazines will take a look at it. If they think there is something there that is you know, crucial or interesting, they might actually um, gather that as part of another bigger blog post that they are writing out there about different products right? And your work might land there. And, uh, you know, hence, taking ownership is important, I think, without, and if you take ownership of your work, and you're very open about it, um, when you get the attention, when your product gets, gets the attention, you will automatically get the attention as well, just because of that association. So again, you have to approach this a little creatively, right? Uh, in, you know, it might seem like, oh, this person is just saying it so easily because it was very organic for her. Um, at the beginning, when, you know, in 2020, when I uh, was uh, told that it's a borderline case, I actually did not have any blog post. I did not have any of this, you know, media attention for the blog post that I like smashing magazine and things like that. I didn't have any of that. That all happened last year, right? Uh, what I had at that time was media attention for the robotics work that I had done. But I had learned something from that. My robot was out there. I had gone for innovation challenges and I had won the innovation challenge and hence press was you know, impressed. They wanted to cover. There were articles about that out there. That was a big learning experience for me. You know, 
if you're working on something cool, don't keep it to yourself. Put it out there. Go for innovation challenges or go for professional, you know, uh, awards, you know, apply for awards. And if you win, then you might get coverage through media and you can use that. So you're not really reaching out to media to, you know, for a paid thing. Yeah, you're not looking for a shortcut. It's a, you're playing a long game, but you're going to make your profile so good. And you as a professional, you're going to stand out so well. So uh, you have to think about it as playing the long game right? Mm. Instead of uh, reaching out to media publications and asking them desperately to cover what you're doing and then paying a lot, right? Sometimes you have to pay like $1,000 and things like that. It's like, instead of doing that, go about it. uh, Think about how you can create a profile very organically. You are really great at what you do. And imposter syndrome is real, but you need to get past that and tell yourself that I need to put my work out there and I need to challenge myself. And if I come out of this challenge at the top, then all of the attention that I need from the media is going to come with that. Um, so it's worth a shot, I think. And that's why I said play the long game. Don't think of it as I need to use a shortcut to go get media attention immediately. Let me build these other criteria, and maybe media, media attention will follow. So, Absolutely. you know, I yeah. And, you know, in your case, um, did you have any, it sounds like a bunch of different um, magazines covered your work. So were any of them in the top tier uh, in your field? Uh, Smashing Magazine, I would say, is top tier for sure. It's very popular mm. in the design community. Mm. Um, but also, like, you know, when it comes to robotics work, any kind of coverage from just any publication is really great. Uh, I mean, there's the uh, Indian uh, unit of like the Chicago, uh, you know, uh, media outlet that covered uh, because so, it is a robot that uh, Indian built. <laughs> so ah. I guess they wanted to they wanted to bring attention to Indian uh, students to come and study. You know that you can do stuff like this. So they they covered uh, the work and talked about how. And, uh, you know, Indian had come up with a speech therapy robot for cleft lip and palate children, why that's a big deal. So there are like coverage like that as well. So I wouldn't say, any, you know, there are student publications that might cover you. There are publications that are professional grade that might see uh, some sort of like an investment opportunity there, you know, to cover your work um, that might get the attention um, when I know you asked for top tier, so I can only think of Smashing Magazine and Salesforce Ben. Salesforce Ben is a Salesforce community led, uh, you know, website, and that gets a lot of users. And uh, you know, one of one of the customers actually wrote about the work that I did, and then credited me uh, by actually crediting my blog post. Amazing. So you know, yeah, so. Again, like I said, you've got to think about this creatively. It's not about appearing in Forbes. It's not about that. So, so in your case, it sounds like you you didn't have, a, you know, wide, um, uh, like 20, 25 different publications, but you had some very key ones in your field that actually mattered, like Smashing, Salesforce, this, what was the Indian publication called? The Chicago one? Chicago Daily Talks or something like that. Chicago, mm-hmm. got it. Awesome. So, you know, we talked about the three criteria, the top three criteria that you applied for. Uh, can you briefly tell me how many in total did you apply for in terms of the criteria? Um, there were seven. We applied for mm-hmm. seven criteria. Yeah. So what was the one that you didn't apply for? I'm curious now. <laughs> um. I didn't apply for judging. I didn't have any kind of judging at that time. Um, I didn't apply for any fine art. You know, there was that one category. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's two categories for arts, I think. Um, Maybe I'm assuming you didn't go for that because there's 10 in total. And out of 10, you applied for seven. So that makes sense. You know, I just want to quickly talk about memberships because memberships is generally considered one of the harder ones, again, since you have to you have to be a member of an outstanding organization. So which uh, organization were you a part of? Um, So we showed a couple over there. Um, One was really compelling, which is I I trained mentor for Mentor Collective. Um, So this was something that happened through the Indiana University Alum Network. They reached out to me and asked me if I'm interested in being a mentor. 
Um, in fact, they were doing a lot of cover around like successful professionals coming out of Indiana University at that time. I think that piqued their interest because I appeared on that. Um, and once they covered that, they asked me if I was interested in being a mentor. And I went through like a training with them in order to become that mentor. Um, so as a trained mentor for Mentor Collective, I actually provided a lot of mentorship for the design community, um, you know, professionals as well as students. So it was a wide, uh, you know, range of, you know, mentorship work that I did at that time through Mentor Collective. Um, and uh, also, you know, I uh, volunteered a lot of my time to work with AIGA. I was actually part of uh, one of the panels that they did. Um, in order to provide, you know, more, uh, you know, insights into the field, what it is like to be a product designer, what it, what it's like to have the skill set that I have. And this was also kind of like a mentorship for, you know, the design community in general. So mm. AIGA is like a, is a professional network. Um, I'm, I'm actually not a, because I was part of the panel, we were able to show that. Um, and uh, yeah, but mainly I think Mentor Collective was the thing gotcha. that really pushed that point. And I'm also a speaker for Women Talk Design. Um, so yeah, and I, I'm part of their network. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, awesome. Well, I mean, you have seven categories. I, you know, I, it sounds like there's so much more we can talk about, but there's a few other topics I want to touch on as well. And one of them is letter of recommendation. So besides providing evidence for three, three out of 10 categories, you also need to get advisory opinions from organizations or letters from experts. So uh, how many letters did you get and who did you approach for these letters? Uh, great question. And this is actually very key. This uh, varies from person to person. In my case, I uh, provided six letters uh, for someone who is from a different field, uh, different kind of experience, they might have to give only three letters, right? Um, I come from a very vast uh, background, right? I've done a whole lot of different things. So I worked in the animation industry before, and I use a lot of the skill set currently for the product design work that I do. So my letters encompass all of this, you know, dating 12 years back from when I started working in the animation industry. I got letters from uh, the top people in my network um, who were aware of my work, uh, who may, may not have managed me directly, but mm. were in leadership role that they were aware of what I had done, uh, what I had contributed. Uh, so it's definitely people that I know, right? It's not, it's not some random person, you know? Mm. Um, so uh, one of them was, uh, is a director, uh, was a director when I was working for the animation company. And uh, he is, uh, he has his own studio. Now. He's actually head of, uh, head of the studio now, uh, another studio. Uh, so I, I got one of my letters from him to directly tie the kind of work that I had done uh, for the animation company and then directly tying that to what I'm doing currently. So um, in my journey, I went to, you know, I, I went into robotics for a little bit after that. So, for, uh, you know, to show my work around robotics, I got endorsement letter from a uh, dean, a professor at Indiana University is a dean. And he, uh, you know, someone who actually organized the innovation challenge uh, that I pass participated in. So he was very much aware of the work that I had done and everything that I had offered. So I got a letter from him. Got yeah. it. I, it, I want to kind of... Uh... I want to talk about how did you decide who to get letters from? So briefly, tell me the framework you use to say, I'm going to get letters from experts in my field who know about my work. And was there something else that you were trying to optimize for when you were thinking of yeah. like, here's a list of people? Okay. So when I first approached this, I wasn't sure whom I should ask for and what it meant when, you know, top of your network means, because I got a lot of different information from different types of lawyers before that. My company had mm -hmm. told some something else, uh, you know, Murthy Law Firm told me something else. So the current lawyers, the lawyers that I actually worked with, uh, they gave me a really good insight into all of this. And they were the ones who said, don't go for, you know, people that you haven't really worked with or like who don't know your work, right? Think about anyone at the very top of your network, right? That need not be, uh, CEO, 
Mm-hmm. As long as, you know, even if it's a VP, if a, you know, they might be a director of design or a VP or a director of the animation company or like head of a studio, or maybe they're just engineering managers, right? It doesn't matter, but they need to be some of the top people in your industry who are doing things. And you can get, you know, letters from that. So I actually created a list of like 12 to 15 people. I worked through that. So I showed them the list of these people that I had worked with and they helped me identify uh, whom I should ask from them. Mm. Uh, but I also had a good intuition, I guess, like there are these people, you know, are like super, super important. You know, they know your work. They worked with you. They hold a really good standing out there. They have their mm. names out there as well. So people can identify them. So, you know, I kind Got of uh, went through that process. Yeah. Amazing. Um you know, I want to jump into the last section of what I'd like to talk about, which is something not talked about often, the emotional tax that immigrants pay while going through this entire process. Um, Your journey, it sounds like it took about three years from the day you learned about the EB1 in mid-2020 or early 2020 until you got it in mid-2023. So I'm curious, um, what were some of the emotional challenges that you remember facing acutely and what helped you cope in those moments? Uh, yeah, right at the beginning, it was like, is this even possible? Right? Um, I didn't see myself as an extraordinary individual, right? So it, it's like, you don't you don't think you're an extraordinary individual. That's not something that comes as an innate thing unless you're like a narcissist, right? But, you know, um, so there are peaks in this. There are stuff that you have done and it gets attention. At that time, you know, your hope kind of goes up. And then, you know, something else happened. Hope is lost. So it's like a roller coaster. You go through a lot of those emotions. And I briefly mentioned my husband and I had taken the decision that if this doesn't work, that we would leave the country, go somewhere else, right? So there were a lot of unknowns for us. So in my case, we talked about it. We were on the same page about the fact that we would be positive. We'd go through this, but not expect, uh, you know, not expect the outcome to be in our favor all the time. So we thought of it as we are going to try this out and we'll see if it lands, it lands. If it doesn't land, it's okay. You know, I don't mind. It's fine. Right. So we went in with that attitude because Quite frankly, there are a lot of unknowns in this. Like you don't know if, uh, you know, things would work, you know, whether you're going to get an RFE, you're not going to get an RFE, if it's good enough. Have I, uh, do I have a really good uh, kind of profile here? At that time, I didn't know anyone who got, uh, who had gotten their EB1. Um, actually, I met like one person that I briefly had a phone call with who actually had an EB1A at that time. And uh, she had done a completely different route, you know, papers, research, right? Like hers was a completely different route. So I didn't know anyone else who had done this. So I I was like, you know, we'll see, right? That's the space I was in. And, uh, and hence, I think it's important to be very practical going through this. Don't put all your hopes and dreams. But it's very, very important to identify the right lawyer. For in my case, for two years, I did not have good, you know, lawyers who could actually help me process this. And then I found my current lawyers, uh, Bay Immigration Law, they were amazing. You know, they gave me a lot of, you know, from the very first call, actually, I had my first call with them thinking about EB5. You know, we were like, okay, should we figure out what an investor visa is? Let's talk to them. I had a 25 minute call with the, you know, managing director and the entire trajectory changed. We, uh, you know, because I was talking about EB-5 and and then I mentioned, you know, I thought about EB-1A at some point, but I don't know if I qualify. And he was like, tell me, tell me more, you know, just tell me about yourself. I just gave mm-hmm. him an insight. I, I probably spoke to him for two minutes. And then he said, you know, your, well, it just, it, it's incredible because what he told me was that your profile sounds like one of the most successful profiles. And I am very, very confident that we can get you the EB1A. So mm-hmm. if you're going for it, I would I would say you should just go for it. It's like, why are you saying that? Because my company lawyers told me that you can't do this. And, you know, other law firms also told, in fact, I had checked in with my company lawyers just a month before with all of the stuff that I had done, right? 
And they told me that I still had a borderline case. That's what they told me. A month later, I found the, you know, Bay Immigration Law and I had the same conversation with them. And they told me that this is possibly one of the strongest cases. So, you know, like, he said, well, uh, he said slam dunk, a gold standard case. <laughs> I mean, those are things that I didn't hear before. So that that gave me a lot of uh, hope that, you know, this is something that I could do. And because I had such great lawyers pushing me to, you know, engaging with me and answering a lot of questions, I felt very encouraged. So my biggest advice would be find the correct lawyers who know your field, who, who are willing to work with you, who can creatively think about all of this, who know exactly what they're doing, who have had success in actually, you know, building a case for EB1A for your field. I think that is possibly the most important advice I can give to anyone uh, at this point. So uh, you can use my spot case on. as a kind of a reference point for something like this. Yeah. No, it's spot on. I mean, it's insane that a lot, one lawyer says you will absolutely not get it while the other lawyer says it's a slam dunk case. And it just shows you that it is a spectrum. Lawyers are a spectrum. Yeah. Not everyone, you know, has this insight of looking into the future to see what this person could do, if not now in a few months or in a few years. So um, this has been really great and such a unique journey that you have. Um, I want to end with this question of, if given another chance, is there anything that you would have done differently in your EB1 journey? To begin with, I would have tried finding the right lawyers earlier. Um, I would have filed earlier. Uh, you know, I think I got very lucky be because I filed, you know, because of when I filed. Um, you know, my initial uh, perm was filed for 2020. So my date uh, for the EB2 was 2020. We were able to use that when we filed for the EB1A. So I was able mm. to get on the current yes. Um, and uh, my filing happened on February 9th. It took a one week. It took one week for USAIS to get back to me, telling me that mm. I, I'm approved, right? Mm. So, but I know that now the dates are retrogressing, right? So yep. for me, I feel like I really hit that mark where <laughs> if I had waited any longer, you know, I it may not have happened yet. You know, I'd still be waiting. So um, I would I would have filed sooner. So hence, again, pushing my point, find the lawyer at the earliest, even if you don't think you have a case. You have spoken to your company lawyers. They have said, this is no good. Company lawyers actually say that. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a trend out there. Company lawyers, they generally tell you that your profile is not good. And that is something I learned later on. So uh, it's important to engage with your own lawyers. And that's the biggest advantage of EB1A. You can file for your EB1A all by yourself. You don't need your company to file it for you. So find your own lawyers and interview. Interview different lawyers to make sure they understand your field. Make sure you find lawyers who have experience in filing for your field. So then you would get a little bit more creative, more specific kind of feedback on how to build your case and where you can go from there. It was such a pleasure. I mean, I love that you didn't just talk about your story. At every point, you also talked about what advice you would give someone else who's going through this process. And I think that, you know, just as me hearing as an audience, it's been incredibly helpful. So thank you so much, Pavitra. And really, really appreciate you taking the time for this. Yeah, and thank you so much to you and the entire team. And I'm very happy that I was able to come on board and do this interview. And uh, I'm really hoping that a lot of people actually see that, see this and take a lot okay. from this. I will be posting a blog post about my experience and more detailed in depth, uh, in depth about like every single criteria and my advice okay. on that. Uh, please keep a look out. I also have office hours that I actually, uh, you know, provide consultation in terms of just giving advice. You know, EB1A is a very specialized, individualized approach. One size mm -hmm. fits all is not a thing, right? So it differs from person to person. What I can do from my end is remove some of those doubts and provide a more clearer picture on 
what your next steps can be, what are the different ways you think about things, um, you know, just based on my experience. So uh, I guess just this is just like an FYI, right? Like a PSA to everyone just to reach out and book office hours with me if necessary. And uh, yeah, I'm happy Absolutely. to be Absolutely, we will add that in the transcript for the video. So thank you once again and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hi again. Thank you so much for watching that. If you're not part of the Unshackle community yet, check unshackle.club to join hundreds of extraordinary immigrants and get access to free consults with lawyers, weekly events and masterclasses, a resource hub, discussion forums, and most of all, a roadmap to reach your goal. Thank you.